This is Metal Mike, and in this episode, I talk again to the main man from Lillian Axe, Steve Blaze. We talk about the latest news on the new album and current lineup changes. We also talk about the late 90s era and beyond of the band. Stay tuned after the interview to hear details about my new show, The Metalhead Bash. Steve, welcome back to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing tonight, my man? I am doing very well. How are you? Good to talk to you again. Yeah, man. Same here. So I was, I was thinking to myself, you're probably thinking, all right, how is this 80s glam metal podcast still going? That's A. And B, why the hell did I agree to do it again, right? <laughs> Not at all, man. No? <laughs> hey, look, you know, that, that was an era of music. The great thing about it is there's some bands, a lot of them still out there doing it now. You know, Lillian's been, that's where we got our start, you yeah. know. And, uh, you know, we're still around, gosh, how many years is it, you know? <laughs> It's great, but it's uh, actually probably in the last three decades, the one genre of music that hasn't completely fizzled away, you know? I mean, it's true. It, there's still a huge, uh, not only is there a, a still a huge fan base for it, but a lot of uh, young kids are getting finally getting turned on to that style of music. And, you know, uh, a lot of the bands from the 80s have developed and are, are still out there and, and making great music still. So, you know, I told you, I'm, I'll always be on your show man anytime you want to have me i'm here for you i appreciate that man well hey a lot has happened since we last talked i mean covid19 obviously is is insane it's changed the whole world uh how are you and your family doing through all this we're actually doing really well i mean we are abiding by the rules we're you know staying uh my wife and and son gosh they haven't really even left the house in the last month or five weeks or however long it's been except for us to get in the car and take a ride you know we went to target the other night we masked up and we all went in but um you know we we all like uh being home and my son's doing his school every day from home my wife teaches college she's able to do her courses online you know i go out and handle my company and and do my business but for the most part just waiting to get this thing over with let it run its course do what it needs to be done adapt and and then move forward but um Staying good and healthy. Last time we talked, you were working on a new album. How has this whole thing affected that? the progress of that? Well, it's affected in that we can't get in the studio. Okay. <laughs> so, right. um, you know, that's, uh, you know, for the last two months or so, we haven't been able to get in. Uh, that, that's that been holding us back because, you know, we've got some changes in the band right now and uh, we've, we're ready to get started. I'm sure that's going to be your next question is that you heard that we have a new singer in Lillian Axe. That's right. And, uh, so that kind of segues into that. Uh, we uh, we have three songs in the studio right now that need vocals. The music's all finished. And uh, right when we uh, got the new singer in, ready to get in there and, and start putting his vocals down, this mess occurs. So right. uh, as soon as things lighten up, we'll be going back in there, you know, maybe very soon because in the studio, it's pretty low key. We don't have a lot of people running around and whatnot. So... Uh, I'm hopefully that, you know, by the end of uh, May into June, we can get back in there and, and continue on. So you've touched a little bit on it. You got a new singer. Uh, his name is Brent Graham. Tell everybody how that uh, came about. Well, I met Brent um, when I first started my side project, Sledgehammer, which is my arena rock cover band with Michael Max from Lillian Axe and Danny King, the original drummer for Lillian Axe. We were, uh, Michael and I had Sledgehammer going. Um, we started it off with Guy Gelso on drums, who was Zebra's drummer. And uh, he knew of this guy, Brent Graham, from a local band called Supercharger that had been around for a long time and was popular in every And I said, I've heard of him before, but I'd never you know, really seen him sing. I don't really go out to a lot of the, the local clubs and see local bands that much, you know, because I'm always very, very busy. So I hadn't done that. But he came in, and, I'm, and I was like, he was in the band for about a year to two years just the greatest guy and the, you know one of the strongest best voices you'll ever hear and uh he was in sledgehammer for a couple of years and then um his schedule with his his other band his cover band uh they were playing oh three times a week and it was his money gig you know so mm-hmm. kind of got in the way of sledgehammer so he opted out and then um when this uh opportunity came up with lillian he was the first guy we thought that I thought of. You know, there were uh, it was kind of a no-brainer. I don't know if you remember this, but several years ago, we were asked to be on episode ten of the series on NBC called Constantine. 
Yes, I and, remember that. Um, you talked about that. Yep. When we went to do that, we had Brian was going through some personal issues and couldn't make the filming of that. So I called Brent up and said, Brent, you know, we're doing this. Uh, we're going to be performing as Lillian Axe on an episode of Constantine. Can you fill in for Brian on this episode? So he jumped at it. And uh, that's him on stage with us during that episode. And uh, we went to Atlanta, shot for two days there, and came back. And I always knew, because of the kind of person we are, he was and is, and besides what a great voice he has, that he would be the, the go-to guy if ever we were in the position where Lillian needed a new singer. So when it came up that we decided to uh, mutually split with Brian, I called him immediately, and he was uh, – you know, he had always told me if anything ever came up with the job that he would, you know, it'd be honored to have it. So we were honored to have him, and it worked out very smoothly. He's in. He and I have been doing Saturday night uh, podcasts in my garage. It's live from the man cave. <laughs> Every week you can see him on my uh, on my Facebook page. But we go and we play two hours of acoustic, and I even plug up the electric and, and do Lillian stuff. So. You know, we're jonesing to get out there and do our first gig with him because we were slated to do the first show, four shows in June. The first was going to be a Rock in the Bayou Festival in June with Night Ranger and Winger. Oh, yeah. And yep. uh, I'm trying to think who else. Um, I remember it was like four or five nationals, and we were just, that was going to be Brent's coming out party right there. And so, uh, but that got moved due to the current situation. So uh, now we are just, we've been rehearsing and we're just so eager to get back out there with him and, and uh, introduce him to the world. That's awesome, man. I can't wait till you guys get back doing again. I want to hear this new music with him on it. I'm, I'm excited. Last time we talked, we got cut a little short, so I figure I'll jump in where a couple things I wanted to ask you that I didn't get a chance to. So you mentioned Danny King, okay? So now, do you play with him occasionally, or you did play with him? Well, you know, Danny was the drummer on the first two records. Yep. He was the uh, drummer when uh, we, we formed Lily in, in eight, late 83. And uh, Danny was with us through Love and War album. And then he left the band at that time. And um, when uh, we were, Michael and I were doing Sledgehammer as a side project, and Guy from uh, Zebra was playing drums. And then uh, Guy and the keyboard player wanted to go in a different direction with the band. Michael and I wanted to kind of do a little bit more heavy stuff. They wanted to go a little uh, in a little more of a journey type direction. Mm -hmm. So we amicably split, and Michael and I got Danny King to play drums with us. And Sledgehammer, who, you know, for the last couple of years. So um, he's back with us and uh, playing in Sledgehammer, and it's a lot of fun. We have a great time doing that. Playing the cover band is a whole lot different. It's less, it's, it's, uh, less stressful. Yeah. <laughs> and, plus, and plus it allows me to go back and, and you know, when, when you're doing your own thing, you don't really sit back and go back and, and relearn, uh, you know, old chops and stuff. And I've had a blast just going back and relearning, you know, hundred cover tunes for fun it's you know it keeps me on my toes so it's it's a lot of fun and and uh, the guys in the band are great nice and then the other guy i was going to ask you about was rob stratton because i haven't heard about him in in many many years what's he up to these days i haven't heard about from rob uh, since the, he and, and daddy both left at the same time okay and uh, i have not heard i maybe seen rob one time since then mm -hmm. so i have absolutely no idea wow so you don't even know if he's active as a player or anything? No, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't have any idea. Wow. I mean, it's, um, I know people that have said that they, you know, they see him or they talk to him or whatnot, but no, he hasn't, we haven't stayed in touch with each other over all these years. There's some guys, and, and as you can imagine, um, some, not only do I do podcasting, but I'm almost like a, a, a a glam metal detective almost, you know what I mean? I go back and I try to follow the trail, what happened to some of these guys. And some guys, they don't want to talk about it, man. They're done with it. They don't want to They don't want to revisit it, you know? And I guess you got to respect that. Well, you know what? That is absolutely true. And uh, I, it's kind of weird because I even find that to be the case now. To be honest with you, there's a couple of guys that, uh, that are writing books. Another guy was just trying to put together a timeline and he wanted to talk to some of the, the, the past members. And uh, a few of them were like, nah, I don't feel like talking about it. Don't yeah. want to talk about it. The weird part about it is there's never been any, like, splits uh, between any members and the band that have been bad, like mm -hmm. like due to a fight or, you know, 
get out the band. You're quit. I fire you. You're out. I quit. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's never been like that. It's always been, you know, people wanting to move on and do different things musically or just get out of music, period. So I don't know why I hear that all the time. People, eh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, it may be because some people that have left the band maybe wish they didn't or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or for whatever reason, just, uh, they're just not interested in music anymore. I don't know. But, um, you know, and then some of them are like, oh, absolutely. I'll talk to you about it all day long. So, you know, I, I have no idea. Um, you know, people are people. There's all different kinds. So Exactly, man. It, it's tough to figure out. Well, hey, it is. Here, here's one that, uh, here's a blast from the past. So maybe some people don't even know this, but you played with uh, a version of Angel for a while in the 90s, correct? Yes, I did. What was, um, what was that gig like? Well, it was great because uh, there was a gentleman playing keyboards for him at the time. It was Frank Domino, the original singer, Barry Brandt, the original drummer, Randy Gregg on bass, and a guy named Gordon Gebert was playing keyboards. So Gordon was writing, he wrote a bunch of like tell-all books about uh, musicians, like one about Ace Frehley and one about rock and roll wor- uh, road stories, et cetera. But he called me to interview me for one of his books, and we started talking. He goes, yeah, man, I'm playing keyboards for Angel. He goes, we're looking for a guitar player, and I was like, Dude, I am the biggest Angel fan from <laughs> high school. I said, have you found somebody? They go, well, they got somebody right now. But he goes, I'm going to tell them about, you know, that you're interested. And uh, sure enough, they flew me up to New York. And I went in there, and I was like, look, I was re- I was more prepared than they were. <laughs> so I, I did like two songs, and they were like looking at the manager going, yeah, he's got, he's got. And so I was like, no, keep playing, keep playing. Let's do some more. Well, you know this one? You know that one? They're like, like, no, we don't know that one. We haven't played that in 30 right. years or whatever, 20 years. But, well, let's try it, you know. And I was so geeked up because I was a huge fan when I was a kid, right? So then we just, uh, over the next few years, probably did 30 to 40 shows, a few runs here and there, but couldn't seem to really kickstart it, you know. Yeah. Um, I had uh, loved those guys to death, man. They're all great guys. Frank and I used to roam in the road. We would, uh, we'd have so much fun. Frank's a great guy, and so is Barry. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was to re-record some of the great Angel songs. And let's take the new version of the band, re-record, you know, these Angel songs. Now, this was at a time where Lillian was kind of in a in a wrestling hibernation. Right. So I was putting a lot of, you know, time into wanting to, to make this Angel thing happen. But Frank was kind of thinking that maybe we should just go do all new material. And I said, look, it's been like 15, 20 years since you guys were out. We got to, you know, let people hear the tower and can you feel it and mm-hmm. mirrors and all these great songs. Yep. Let's get in the studio and re-record. So that's what I want to do, but that's not what the direction that they wanted to go at the time. So it kind of fizzled out. You know, Frank was doing a bunch of other stuff. And then um, I think of a year ago, they put a record out. Punky Meadows got back in the band. Yes. And uh, they did a record. So um, I hope they're out there still playing and touring because uh, – I love Angel and the Frank and Barry are great guys. You know, Randy was great, the bass player, and Gordon actually uh, wound up leaving. And we had Michael T. Ross came in to play keyboards for Angel towards the end there. And Michael's played with Lita Ford and uh, Missing Persons, and he's an all around utility guy. He's the keyboard player that everybody calls because he's a really nice guy and he's he's a great player too. He played on one of the Lillian records. He played on. A song called "Within Your Reach" on uh, "Sad Day" on Planet Earth album. Okay. So you got a favorite Angel album? Yeah. Um, well, I say that the first three. The first three. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like that with all of my favorite bands. You know, <laughs> like like with uh, who else? Uh, like with with Queen. Yeah. You know, it's the first three. You know, and. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And, sure. Uh, yeah. It's oh. always. It seems to be like that with a lot of my my favorite bands. First three records. Kiss. First three records, you know? Yep. I think uh, I'm going to say my favorite is uh, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, which would be the third, yeah. correct? So that's one of your three. I feel yeah. like for me, that's when they really got their sound, at least the sound that I like the best. It's right there. It's yep. like, bam, yep. you know? Yeah. That's a great record. That was the first one I ever got. So let's skip to, so you said Lillian Axe was in hibernation, and then uh, you get into the 90s, and you guys release Fields of Yesterday. This is a lot of songs that basically didn't make um, like your official albums. When is the bulk of this right. material from? 
Well, that's kind of right. We released that right around the time that I was doing the Angel thing. Mm-hmm. So okay. that was kind of like the spark. Uh, we had taken a break like in 96, uh, 96 or 97. Lillian took a break for a little bit. You know, I started Near Life Experience with my brother. And <laughs> the other guys were doing some other things. And so then I got the Angel gig. And then we got an offer to put out, uh, you know, put out a record, you know, uh, a deal with Z Records and Pony Canyon in Japan. And they're like, you know, Let's do a new record. I said, I don't have anything right now. The band's in hiatus. He said, well, what do you have to offer? I said, a lot of B-side demos. I mean, straight up demos from different sessions. And they said, let's do it. Go find it. I mean, some of those songs are, are, are the recordings are straight off of cassettes. I mean, that's how raw really? that stuff is. The songs, you know, stood the test of time. They were, they were great songs. And it's like, you know what? We at, if we put it out as a, uh, as a B-side demo album and people will appreciate that, then let's do it. So it was great because it got us to Japan and kind of got the momentum rolling a little bit. And then at that time, I started to really realize the the fan base that we had around the world and like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, please get back together, please get back together. And I was like, I've got all this stuff. And, and I was um, just kind of eager to get back. So I was doing my near life experience thing with put a couple of records out and then, you know, spoke to the other guys and said, let's do some reunion shows. So we did a reunion show in Dallas under the name Psycho Schizophrenia. And in a small club, we put like 750 people in it. So I was like, wow, we got to do this. But at that point, we started to get back together, and I started to write uh, for the Waters Rising record. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it just seemed like we had different factions in the band musically. Mm-hmm. People wanted to do different things. They wanted to, you know, a couple of guys wanted to be the next Stone Temple Pilots. A couple of guys wanted to go off and do their own thing. And it's like, but guys, this is this is the evolution of the band. You know, from the first record to Psycho Schizophrenia, here we are several years later. This is, you know, where I'm going musically and where the band was headed. And I, I've written, you know, the, the major bulk of all the, me- the material and... It's a it's a burden on me to make this band grow and and get better, but it's it's what I love doing, and and you know they uh, didn't all completely fall into wanting to go in that route. I think you know they wanted to go and maybe be uh, in a different style, so to speak, because right at that time, you know, there was a lot of changes going on. Uh, the whole you know Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam thing was at its peak, yep. and here we are, and I'm writing you know Fields of Yesterday and second of may and these epic dark songs and um just kind of it was it was a thing where we were just musically at different you know points in our lives so at that point you know we were doing shows we did even went to europe did some festivals and and that at that point was when you know ron said hey look man i'm just not into the tour and i'm not into the studio and the playing and this and that anymore i just really need a break i don't i just not into doing this anymore and i was like man that is perfectly fine just Work with me. Let me find somebody that can fill your shoes, and uh, we'll go our ways. And so that's when we got Derek Lefebvre, who came in for six years and uh, did a great job. But it's always been like that. It's always been, you know, people change, especially these days. I mean, look at the, the revolving door in musical uh, alliances, you know. Right. You don't ever find three guys that stay together for 40 years, you know. The Zebra's no. the only band that I can, off the top of my head, that can do that, say that. And... Um, you know, haven't had changes. Even they had a change, but it was a medical reason. But, you know, you've got everybody, even Motley Crue, they had member changes, you know, and these are guys that have been around. It happens because people change, you know, their desires and goals in life change. Uh, Sometimes it's for personal reasons and medical reasons. Uh, I'm fortunate to say that it's never been an argument. You know, you hear so many bands breaking up because there's fights and this and that. Never, ever had that. It's, uh, I'm happy about that but i also know that you know lillian axe is not about it's not about the members it's about the music it's about the songs and um we keep on uh and w- if we have to make a change we find somebody that that fits the next chapter and that's what we've done with brent one thing i just got to say to uh kick back to fields of yesterday for a second man you guys throwaway songs are better than some people's regular albums you know what i mean if those are your throwaways <laughs> holy shit <laughs> well the funny part about that is um, a lot of those songs could have made on uh, made it on any one of the records. There's yeah. some of them on there, I think, that are just... Like, I hear When It Rains, and I'm like, if Elton John did that song, it'd probably be a smash, you know? And yep. um, There's some really good songs on there. They were just recorded in demo fashion, you know? Um, not uh, with the, 
the budget and the attention that doing a record allows you to do. But they still sound good and they're cool. It's, it wasn't that the songs weren't good enough to make any records. It, it's that by the time we were doing the next record, there were so many songs written already. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I write way too many songs and I can only put X amount on a record. So uh, those were ones that, you know, uh, if you notice, there's a song called Thirst on there. Yep. Um, and uh, Thirst is a, is a, I think it was one of the bonus tracks on Fields of Yesterday, but it's on uh, the Waters Rising record. So it wound up uh, making the cut for the next record, too, as well. And it was recorded again in better fashion this time. So you know that I love Psycho Schizophrenia, and I was the guy that was waiting for that follow-up. And, man, I had to wait a long time uh, for Waters Rising. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? But what, what, what I, and I know there was demos, so I think some of those demos leaked with Ron. So I, I kind of heard some of that stuff out there. And then... Um, and I got to say with Derek, Derek's voice was very similar to Ron's. You know what I mean? So it kind of was a seamless transition, in my opinion. It was. Um, that was, you know, I, I think, it was, you know, you look at these things and you're saying it's a blessing and a curse. I, I don't look at it like that. I don't, I don't analyze. I listen to the guy sing his song and does he, does he do it? You know, it's not anything that I can sit there and say, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a guy that does this. I'm just listening. And if it works, it works. It's an intangible idea. And when he sang those songs, yeah, he has very similar timbre to Ron. Uh, very tonality-wise. I mean, some of the songs, you almost have to think twice. Yeah, definitely. And some yeah. people did. Yeah. And that worked out good for us because when you take, you know, the original recorded voice from those records and you have to come in and please fans. And, and we have – our fans are – they're rabid, you know, they are dead set. They are opinionated and they are, they want their stuff, you know, and they are, they're, you know, I mean, I appreciate that very much. They are very in love with their stuff. And uh, so I always have to make sure that I'm trying to at least, you know, take that next step and make sure that they understand and that they're pleased. In this case, it worked out, you know, when, when Brian Jones became the singer, Brian didn't sound like anybody else. No. He didn't sound no, like those guys. No. So it was initially a bit more of a challenge to get people to accept him. And then when we put out Days Before Tomorrow and they heard the guy singing Death Comes Tomorrow and Great Divide and Babylon, they they got it, you know. But there's still people out there. They, I mean, you know how it is. Yep. They don't care. You could have Luciano Pavarotti singing for you, and they want a guy that can't carry a bucket, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. just, um, it's just how people are. It, music is emotional. And I, on my end, I have to kind of try to put myself in their shoes, but at the same token, expect them to look at me too, you know? And, yep. Hey, look, what do you want me to do? If uh, if we if a singer leaves the band, do you think we're going to fold? No, we're going to go out and find another great singer. Be open-minded. Look at this. Don't look at it like, it's like, Getting a new girlfriend and and uh, getting mad at her because she doesn't cook the way your first one did or something, <laughs> right, you know. Right, yeah, well, crazy. maybe this one does does stuff ten times better than your first girlfriend. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to be open minded to things, and uh, and sometimes as an artist, uh, you, you have to struggle with that a little bit. And any band out there making changes that says uh, that it's a smooth transition when you make changes is not telling you the truth. So, but we've been fortunate, you know, everybody has come around and, and the people, are, you know, we haven't even done show one with Brent, but they've seen him and heard him singing with me and they know him from uh, around here, especially he's got a great reputation and people love him to death. So uh, we're just excited about getting out there with him. I think sometimes people have to kind of, I understand, like we said before, you, you like the first three albums of a certain band, right? People have to kind of step out of that and almost look at it as the way a job would be. You need somebody yep. to, to do the job. So if yep. if most bands rely on touring, right, that's, that's the main source of, of an income for a band – we need the guy that can pull it off live. You know, it's, I'm a huge Kiss fan. I know you like Kiss too. I know Peter Chris yeah. can't pull it off today. No offense to him. He just, he couldn't do some massive tour right now. He just can't. So right. why are somebody why is somebody just going to say, oh, we got to get Peter back. We got to get Peter back. He, Peter can't do it. You know what I mean? At a certain point, you got to get a guy in there that can do the job, you know? so Right. 
That's just well, the that's the thing, you know, it, it's, and, and most fans get it, but there are some out there that, you know, it, it's such an emotional tie to the music that they have trouble stepping away and looking at it from the in, inside, you know? So as an artist, I try to look through the fans' eyes, right. and at the same token, I appreciate it when the fans see through, things through my eyes. Well, I think that, um, just to finish up on that one with uh, Waters Rising, I mean, there's so many killer tunes, and I feel like you kind of picked up where you left off with Psycho Schizophrenia. Um, especially, hey, man, even with quarantine, you might have a chance to redo that one. What do you think? Well, we've been playing that song <laughs> in our man cave jams on uh, in the last couple of weeks. i got to watch these then. i got to watch it. it. So we're probably, you never know. I mean, right now with Brent, we've got about 35 songs um, down with him, you know, when we're doing a 20-song set at night. So we've got, we're pulling stuff out that we haven't, I mean, some of the stuff we've never done before. The 2nd of May, Picture Perfect. We pulled Body Double back into the set. Nice. Mercy, um, She's My Salvation. I mean, we got a ton of stuff out there that we are, you know, it, it's great because Brent learns, he, he soaks his stuff up like a sponge. So, you know, we're uh, we're adding a lot of uh, new catalog stuff. Plus, we're going to have a whole new record to pick songs from. So it's, um, that's the only issue I have playing live is that we have, you know, Basically, 10 studio records, and you get to play 18 songs in a live show. <laughs> you know, so it's tough. So obviously, you rounded out. You did a couple more albums, Sad Day on Planet Earth, The Days uh, Before Tomorrow. Do you have a favorite um, from the later half of your career so far? Do you have a favorite album out of those you know, last you know, three or four? I'll tell you why I don't. i tell you why I don't. Because like for a while I was telling people I thought Days Before Tomorrow was probably next to Psycho Schizophrenia my favorite album I think the, the, the one that is the most quintessential Lillian album and then I went back and I was I remember one day and I hadn't listened to Sad Day or Deep Red Shadows or um, Waters Rising in a while and I just I was on a long drive and I listened to all three of them and I you know I hate to sound like this because I, I don't at, at, I was just Oh my God, I, I love these records. It's like when people ask, what albums would you, you know, take on a deserted island? I would take ours because I feel like those are the songs that I, I write songs that I would want other people to write, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I just fell in love with them all over again. I was like, wow, we, we really, I was really proud of the band, you know? These are really good records, man. And these are, I, I love it. And going back and, and, uh, reacquainting myself with them. I was like, I can't pick a favorite on any of these. I can tell you, you know, but Psycho is probably uh, my, if I had to pick the one record that I thought, and, and not, not just because of the songs, but the time in my life and where my creativity was, et cetera, that, um, that was a, an amazing time for me in my, in my writing. I really, something happened and I just like flipped the switch right. and went into a whole new way of thinking about writing. And so then I started, I listened to uh, Days Before Tomorrow, and I'm like, some of the songs, like The Great Divide and Babylon and Death Comes Tomorrow, those are, uh, nope, my apologies. Those are like what I think are some of my best pieces, too, as well. So um, I really, if I had to pick it, it would be Psycho, probably, but everything else is a very close second. I had this idea the other day, and I don't know if you ever remember, uh, maybe this was about a year ago, but Ron Keel did this thing where it was like Keel Fest, okay? And he had um, the Ron Keel band and the original Keel, and he had uh, Steeler. He had all these different projects um, that he's been involved with. You ever think of, that you could do something like that with Lillian X? Because you've, you've had a lot of different members, a lot of different projects. What do you think? Steve, Lillian X Fest. What do you think? Would you do a set with the original guys, the new guys? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And you've got sure. side projects, right? right? Uh, all the different I would do ones it for the got? money, and I, honestly, I, it would have to be for the money and the nostalgia of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the band right now, you know, every whatever the current lineup is, you know, that's that's the band. That, that's you know, the that's, band. I'm solid with that. Um, I'm not Mr. Nostalgia as far as, uh, band members go and that kind of thing. I think it would be great. I mean, I look, look, I've tried that before in the past mm -hmm. when we did the one night in the temple, the double live acoustic show, the private show that we did, uh, where we filmed the documentary. Um, I invited Johnny Vines to come. Johnny Vines came down and he, uh, and he sang two songs with us. He was the original singer before we got signed. Mm -hmm. He got on stage and did a couple of songs with us. 
I did invite Ron to come in for that. He declined. Okay. I invited Ron and Aaron to come when we got inducted into the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame. Uh, I invited them to come down and and get an award because they were just as everybody that was in the band uh, deserved a part of that uh, um, that special award of being inducted into the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. They declined on coming down for that too, even mm-hmm. they were they were going to get you know plaques with their name on it. You know, so I mean. I, I I can't control people. I, everything's open. Anybody that's ever been a part of this band, from a road crew member to a publicist to a band member, is a part of, of the band's legacy. That's the way I look at it, and they're always welcome. Nice. But I will not go around begging people, and I will not, you know, I will not be held back by anything like that. I will never look. I could have if I needed to replace everybody in the band, I would be completely upset. You know, I'd be <laughs> very bummed out about it, but I wouldn't lay over and, and give it up. I'm not ever going to do that. No, you shouldn't. Uh, what do you got going on with your podcast? Anything you want to uh, pitch on here? What, what do you got? What's going on? Sure. On every other Sunday night at 7 o'clock, I have my podcast. It's called The Love and War Show with myself and my buddy Todd Schmidt, who's one of my producers on my ghost hunting show. Um, we have a show, and it is uh, pretty much two hours of, a little bit of ranting and us talking about things that bother us, you know, a little current, not a lot of politics, but more current things going on and a lot of funny. Uh, we cut up, my little boy comes on there and gives his jokes of the week, <laughs> and my stage manager, Al uh, Moran, is on, and he is a, he's a character, and uh, Jew tries to stump him with trivia, and they have to, uh, he gets money if he stumps Al, and he's got to give candy to Al if he loses. And then we do a uh, carry, we call it a uh, karaoke, where Al dresses up as a different character every week, and I play acoustic guitar, and he sings uh, or tries to sing uh, different uh, artists. Like one week he's Rod Stewart, the next week he was uh, uh, Hall, Daryl Hall, then he was Elvis, then he was uh, the guy from uh, Men Without Hats. Every week is something. So it's just two hours of us having fun and cutting up and it's funny my mom comes on there sometimes <laughs> and she's a character and we're getting like this cult following uh so come check us out we've done 28 episodes already you can there's a love and war channel uh, a love and war show channel on youtube and you can go to my facebook page and see all the episodes as well and then uh, i'm still working on my ghost hunting show and uh trying to get it picked up i think we're going to shoot a pilot uh, as soon as things lighten up, maybe in June, we're working on that right now, and uh, and then you know continuing on getting re- Lillian, re- Lillian ready to play and finish up the new record. So nice. Well, hey, thanks for a, a great conversation. I think we've uh, pretty much covered everything I could think of. But when you know, who knows, man? Once your new album comes out, I'll be promoting it on my Twitter. So all right, my friend, thank you very much. And look, call me anytime. Any anything you need, let me know. Yeah, appreciate it. Have a good one, and uh, I hope you guys all stay safe and healthy. You too, brother. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you too, Steve. Wow, it's always a great conversation with Steve. He is the man. But now it's time to talk about the Metalhead Bash. So guess what? We brought back the Headbangers Ball, kind of, uh, last weekend, and we called it the Metalhead Bash. We played all kinds of videos from all of your favorite bands, Wasp, Kiss, Motley Crue, you name it. And we filtered in all kinds of skits and clips from the 80s glam metal cast. So you want to become a subscriber so you don't miss future episodes of that and the 80s glam metal cast. Rock on!